All right, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm excited to tell you about, uh, more about uh, data independent memory hard functions. Um, so let me start off with a motivation, uh, which is really why I started working on memory hard functions. Uh, right, so password storage, we have an attacker that breaks into an authentication server, steals the hash of a user's password, and now the attacker can try as many guesses as they want offline to crack the user's password. They're really only limited by the resources that they invest in this, uh, in this attack. Um, unfortunately, these attacks are an increasingly common problem. Uh, at this point, uh, um, you know, breaches happen so fast that I'm not even able to keep this slide up to date. Uh, and uh, we've had billions of user accounts that, uh, that have been affected. So the goal of a memory hard function, intuitively, we want a moder moderately expensive hash function, which should be fast to evaluate on a personal computer, and expensive to evaluate even if the attacker is using some application-specific integrated circuit. Uh, so maybe some supercomputer uh, is shown on the left here. So intuitively, a memory hard function is a function where computation costs should be dominated by memory cost. So our goal here is we want to force the attacker to lock up large amounts of memory for the entire duration of computation. And this uh, um, intuitively implies that uh, the computation will be expensive even if the adversary is using customized hardware. So we have a couple examples of uh, memory hard functions. Uh, Scrypt is uh, a prime example. Um, here, Scrypt is an example of a data dependent memory hard function. So the memory access pattern here depends on the user's input, uh, and so we have to worry about side channel leakage, right? So a side channel uh, might leak information about the uh, user's input, uh, which in this case uh, might be a sensitive password. So in this talk, we're going to focus entirely on something called data independent memory hard functions. Uh, these are just memory hard functions uh, whose memory access pattern does not leak any information about the, the user's input. Okay, so to specify a data independent memory hard function, uh, we need to do two things. We need to specify a directed acyclic graph G and a labeling function H. Um, now typically H we think of as being a random oracle. Um, as we saw in the last talk, it's okay for H to be uh, um, you know, ideal permutation or an ideal cipher. Um, so there's other ways to build H here, but uh, in this talk we'll focus on, uh, on random oracles. Um, intuitively, the DAG encodes data dependencies, right? So the label of an internal node is the hash of the labels of its parents. And the output of this function is just the label of the last, last node in this graph. Um, so we'll use big N to denote the total number of uh, graphs, and typically we'll assume that, uh, uh, at least in this talk, we'll assume that N is a power of two. So we'll use little n for the, that power. Okay, so when we talk about uh, evaluating a memory hard function, uh, a common way to, uh, um, to describe evaluation strategies is in terms of graph pebbling. Um, so here we've got a graph. Uh, we start off with no pebbles in the graph, then we can place a pebble on the source. Uh, now that we have a pebble on node one, we can place a pebble on node two. Um, right Now we can place a pebble on node three. Um, now we have the data to uh, you know, pebble node four, pebble node five, et cetera. Um, so the rules of a, uh, of a pebbling um, is basically you have, to wait until, you have to wait to pebble a node until all the dependent uh, data labels are already in me memory. All right, so when we talk about uh, evaluation, we're typically going to use the language of, uh, of graph pebbling. All right, uh, so now uh, the important question is how do we measure the cost of a pebbling? And there's a couple different approaches. Uh, um, one uh, nice uh, initial attempt is space-time complexity. So um, here uh, you just look at the maximum number of pebbles on the graph at any point in time in the pebbling, multiply by the total time. Right, so this is maximum space used multiplied by, uh, by time. Um, so what's the problem with this? Uh, well, the problem is that uh, space-time complexity doesn't amortize nicely. Um, so as we can see on this slide, let's suppose that we have a computation that requires a lot of space initially and then runs for a lot of time without much space at all. Um, in this case, if the attacker wants to compute multiple instances of this function, they can compute all of those instances at one time. Um, interleave them, and uh, here the space-time complexity of 
you know, computing multiple instances is roughly the same space-time complexity of computing just one instance of the function, right? So if this is a password attacker, uh, we, don't want, uh, we don't want to give the attacker this advantage. So Alwin and Sermonenko uh, proposed a, a different metric called uh, cumulative memory complexity or uh, cumulative pebbling complexity for graphs. Um, here, we're just going to sum uh, over all pebbling rounds, total number of pebbles on the graph uh, at that point in time, right? So instead of the area around this curve, we're going to look at the area under the curve. Um, the nice thing about this is that it uh, actually approximates amortized area time complexity quite nicely. Um, right, uh, the cumulative memory complexity of computing two instances of this function is two times the complexity of computing one instance of the function. Um, okay, so we're going to use uh, this notion of attack quality uh, when we uh, evaluate uh, memory hard functions. Uh, so the naive sequential pebbling is just going to cost uh, n squared over two, roughly, right? Pebble node one, pebble node two keep all the pebbles on the graph, uh, at the end of the day, your cost is roughly n squared over two. Um, so intuitively, we want to ensure that uh, the optimal pebbling that the attacker might try is nearly as expensive as this naive pebbling strategy. Um, right, so the attack quality um, really measures the attacker's success in reducing his cost, right? So we can talk about the quality of a pebbling attack as the ratio n squared over two divided by the cumulative cost of the, the pebbling. So for example, if we have a uh, pebbling with attack quality 10, this means that the attacker reduced his cost by one order of magnitude. All right, uh, one more uh, metric to uh, measure the uh, quality of the memory hard function, uh, sustained space complexity. So um, here, uh, this is actually a more, re more stringent requirement than uh, cumulative memory complexity. Um, so we'll define S sustained space complexity as the time or number of pebbling rounds in which the attacker has at least S pebbles on the graph, um, right? So intuitively, uh, right, if we have S sustained space complexity T, uh, then the cumulative memory complexity has to be at least S times T, um, right? So this is a, a stronger requirement. Um, and intuitively, it, uh, um, it, if, we, if we have high uh, ST uh, sustained space complexity, uh, then we can rule out attacks in which the attacker has low memory, uh, low memory usage for any, uh, um, for any point in time. Uh, what I'll say about this is that uh, building a graph with high sustained space complexity is a very challenging goal. Um, so uh, we gave a uh, theoretical construction at Eurocrypt last year. Um, but there are no known uh, practical constructions with strong uh, sustained space complexity guarantees. Um, okay, good. So um, let me uh, give you a brief overview of uh, what we know about uh, um, constructing and attacking depth robust graphs. Um, in particular, there's a property called depth robustness, which is uh, um, really the key to analyzing uh, um, data independent memory hard functions. So depth robustness, uh, given a DAG uh, G, we say that it's ED depth robust if for all sets of E nodes, uh, deleting those nodes from the graph uh, still leaves a path of length at least D, um, right? So we can say that a uh, graph is ED depth robust if it satisfies this property. If it doesn't satisfy this property, we can say that the graph is ED reducible. So here's an example of an uh, ED reducible graph, right? If we delete these two nodes, then uh, the longest remaining path in the graph is, uh, is two. Okay, um, so uh, crypto 2016, uh, we gave an attack which shows that if your graph is not uh, uh, depth robust, uh, then we can get uh, right, a parallel pebbling attack that uh, has a cumulative memory complexity little o of n squared. Uh, so in other words, the attack quality is going to, uh, to be omega of one. Um, a corollary here is actually, um, right, any, any directed acyclic graph with n degree two um, has cumulative memory complexity at most n squared log log n over log n, right? So there's this general upper bound. Um, and this actually separates data independent memory hard functions from data dependent memory hard functions, right? So data dependent memory hard functions we can get all the way up to n squared, um, but that's not possible for uh, data independent memory hard functions. 
Um, and in fact, uh, for practical um, instantiations of memory hard functions like argon 2i, um, we can get even higher quality attacks. Okay, um, so what about building a secure memory hard function? Uh, well, uh, there's this generic lower bound that says that if your graph is ED depth or bust, then your cumulative uh, pebbling cost is at least E times D. Um, and uh, at CCS in 2017, uh, we gave a practical construction of a graph that's ED depth or bust, where E is N over log N, uh, D is omega N. Um, here, this means that CC is at least N squared over, over log N. Okay, so this is nice. Uh, theoretically, this is nearly optimal. Um, and uh, so if we compare to argon 2i, um, asymptotically, DR sample is superior. Um, so then, then, of course, we can ask the important question, well, uh, you know, sometimes theory is different, uh, different from practice, so uh, what about uh, the constant factors here? And uh, in the CCS uh, paper, uh, um, our empirical analysis uh, suggested that theory matched practice, uh, right? So here we can see uh, the best uh, pebbling attack we found against DR sample, and it has low quality. And then we can look at the best uh, um, attack we found against argon 2i, and it has higher quality, um, right? So empirically, uh, the you know, theory seemed to match, uh, match practice. So um, now I can uh, tell you about our contributions. So uh, we present a new analysis of the greedy pebbling attack, and we show that it's uh, surprisingly effective against uh, DR sample. And in fact, it reverses uh, prior conclusions. So actually, argon 2i now provides uh, stronger resistance to known pebbling attacks than uh, uh, DR sample, at least for practical parameter regimes. Um, we also give a new heuristic algorithm uh, for constructing small depth-reducing sets. Uh, um, unfortunately, for lack of time, I'm not going to be able to describe that, uh, but you can see the paper for, for details. I'll just remark that it uh, significantly improves on uh, um, prior algorithms in all of our empirical analysis. Um, and it potentially has impl implications for many other cryptographic objects where depth robust graphs are used, such as um, proofs of replication, proofs of space, uh, obviously memory hard functions, et cetera. Okay, um, another contribution here, um, and this is um, a trivial observation, but uh, nevertheless one that I include because I think it's important. Uh, so there's an easy way to parallelize computation of the argon 2i round function. Um, and uh, if you implement this, it actually increases, or it reduces the attacker's cost by nearly an order of magnitude. Um, so what about uh, on the positive side? Uh, well, we give a new uh, construction of a data independent memory hard function. Uh, by combining DR sample with a graph called a bit reversal graph. Um, and we show that this uh, graph uh, has optimal resistance to all known pebbling attacks. Uh, and also, it's uh, the first practical construction with uh, strong sustained space complexity guarantees. I'll say more about that uh, in a bit. Um, so we also give a new pebbling reduction uh, for um, the XOR labeling rule, uh, I'll say more about that in a bit, uh, but this is the labeling rule that is, uh, is used in practice. So um, I should contrast the pebbling reduction with uh, um, Binyi and Stefano's uh, reduction. So we're still assuming that uh, H is a random oracle here, but uh, the way that the random oracle is used uh, in practice uses this XOR labeling rule. Um, the way, uh, well, Prior pebbling reductions assumed that uh, the random oracle was used in a much different way, um, and that can introduce some, uh, some challenges. Okay, um, we also give a construction of an inherently sequential round function, um, so we can reclaim this, uh, this order of magnitude uh, um, cost reduction. Okay, um, so let me uh, start off by telling you about the greedy pebbling attack. Uh, and this is actually quite a simple, uh, simple attack. Uh, um, so here, uh, we're going to pebble nodes in topological order, and we're just gonna discard a node on pebble v, um, right, after uh, that pebble is no longer needed, right? So as soon as we've uh, pebbled the greatest child of node v, uh, we can remove our pebble on, on node v. 
right? So it's a sim simple uh, sequential pebbling strategy. Um, and uh, um, Bonnet et al. showed that uh, the strategy yields attack quality roughly, uh, you know, five against uh, argon 2i. Um, so now the parallel pebbling attacks uh, um, against argon 2i, they actually yield a higher quality attack, uh, right? So we get uh, omega n to the um, 0 0.22. So it's an asymptotic improvement, not a constant, constant factor improvement. Um, and uh, for this reason, uh, in our CCS paper, uh, we actually didn't look at the uh, performance of the greedy pebbling algorithm. Um, and in hindsight, that was, uh, that was a mistake. Um, right, so what we show uh, in this paper is that uh, the greedy pebbling algorithm is effective against DR sample. Namely, it achieves attack quality log n. Um, and this actually matches the asymptotic lower bound, uh, right? Uh, we proved that uh, um, CC is at least n squared over log n, so this is, uh, this is tight. Uh, what's important here is that uh, we have good constant factors. Um, so now if we uh, redo the plot, including the greedy uh, pebbling uh, strategy, uh, here's argon 2i, and uh, here's attack quality versus DR sample. Um, so we have high quality attacks against uh, both, but uh, we have even higher quality attacks against, uh, against DR sample. Okay, and this is even if we go all the way up to uh, um, n is equal to two to the 24, which I think is on the higher end of what, uh, um, what one might consider for, uh, for parameter settings. Okay, um, now I'll just uh, advertise here, our new construction is down at the bottom of this plot, so uh, we do find a way to, to fix the problem. Okay, um, so now we have an attack which is surprisingly effective against DR sample. Um, we'd like to construct a new DAG which uh, provides strong resistance to both attacks. Um, so, uh, right, uh, the parallel depth reducing attacks uh, from crypto uh, 2016 uh, were especially effective against argon 2i and many other IMHF candidates. Uh, DR sample was specifically designed to resist these types of attacks. Uh, but uh, as we just showed, the greedy pebbling attack is effective against DR sample. So to construct a DAG that resists uh, both attacks, we start off with uh, this bit reversal graph. Um, here, uh, right, uh, we can represent each node uh, by, um, by a bit sequence, and we have two layers of nodes. And we'll have an edge from, uh, let's look at this node, 0, 1, 1. So if we reverse those bits, that's 1, 1, 0. So we'll add an edge from here to 1, 1, 0. Now, uh, this is an old graph. Uh, it was analyzed by uh, Lingwauer and Tarjan uh, back in uh, 1982, and they showed that uh, any sequential pebbling has space-time complexity n squared. Um, in fact, for this reason, uh, this was the basis of the Catena um, IMHF proposal. So a natural question to ask is, uh, what about the cumulative memory complexity of sequential pebblings? Um, and uh, this is a, uh, a harder result, uh, um, but if you use the right potential function, you can actually prove that uh, uh, the cumulative memory complexity is still um, n squared, right? So not just the space-time complexity, uh, um, but the cumulative memory complexity is also n squared. Um, but this is only for sequential pebblings. So um, unfortunately, uh, the bit reversal graph is not uh, a good candidate uh, in, when we use it alone. Um, the reason is that uh, Alwyn and Serbanenko back in 2015, uh, they gave a parallel pebbling with space-time complexity uh, n to the 1.5, right? So if you allow for parallel pebblings, actually the space-time complexity is not, uh, not very high. Okay, so to patch this uh, um, problem, uh, we overlay uh, the bit reversal graph with a depth robust graph, uh, in particular DR sample. Um, so if we start with DR sample, our depth robust graph on the bottom, and our bit reversal graph on the top, all we're going to do is we're going to, um, you know, move DR sample on top of the, the bit reversal graph, um, and this gives us our, our overlaid graph. Um, the first uh, layer now represents uh, um, the depth robust graph, and we have all the same edges connecting the first and second layer. So, um, Empirical analysis uh, demonstrates that this graph is resistant to all known uh, pebbling attacks. Um, so it inherits, 
inherits uh, resistance to uh, depth-reducing attacks um, from DR sample. It inherits resistance to uh, sequential pebblings um, from the bit reversal graph. And this includes the greedy pebbling attack in any variant of the you know, greedy pebbling attack because we can show that it resists any sequential pebbling strategy. Um, but uh, more interesting, uh, this combined graph actually yields stronger uh, new properties. So it's the first graph uh, with strong sustained space complexity guarantees. Um, so in particular, we can prove that any parallel pebbling of this graph uh, either has maximal sustained space complexity, n over log n pebbles for n rounds, or uh, the cumulative cost of this pebbling is even larger than n squared. Um, Right, so this graph actually achieves uh, high sustained space complexity. And in fact, if you play with these uh, parameters, you can uh, guarantee that you, know, uh, you need uh, um, S pebbles for, uh, for T rounds, and you get a steeper uh, penalty if you decrease S here. Um, we can also prove that under plausible conjectures, which uh, you know, see the paper for those conjectures, uh, any parallel pebbling has cumulative cost at least N squared log log n over log n, right? So we pick up this extra log n factor, and this, uh, um, this would be an asymptotically tight, uh, tight result. Um, okay, uh, good, so uh, we can also um, now turn our attention back to, uh, to pebbling reductions. Um, so Alwin and Cervenenko previously showed that, uh, you know, any DAG in the um, parallel random oracle, sorry, any uh, algorithm evaluating our memory hard function, the parallel random oracle model, can be described in terms of an equivalent cost uh, um, pebbling strategy. So the implication now is that uh, to analyze the graph, it's uh, sufficient to understand the pebbling cost of, of G. Um, but now uh, we're gonna open the hood a little bit and ask what's the labeling function that's used? Uh, so in Alwin and Serbanenko, uh, they assume that the labeling function used uh, um, concatenation of labels, right? So before we apply the hash function, we concatenate all the parent values and then hash them together. Now in practice, uh, something different is done. Uh, namely, we take all the parent labels, we XOR them together, and then we hash. Um, so we'll call this the XOR label rule. Um, and this tends to be what's used in, in practice, uh, namely because it's uh, much more efficient. So this prior intuition that uh, we can focus on pebbling cost, one might wonder, is this actually still true for IMHFs that use the XOR labeling rule? Um, and actually the answer uh, is not always. Um, so here's, uh, here's a graph uh, where if you use the XOR labeling rule, uh, the function that you define is actually a constant function, right? Uh, and here the problem is uh, that uh, W and X uh, they have the same sets of parents, which means that they're going to have the same labels. Uh, and now Y is the hash of label W, X or label X, which is just the hash of label zero, right? So in fact, uh, it's pretty easy to compute this function, and the cost is not at all related to the pebbling cost of this, uh, of this graph. So what we can show is that if your graph uh, satisfies this property, which we call the unique parent property, that uh, now the same uh, pebbling reduction can go through. Um, so namely, the cost of pebbling the graph is equal to the cumulative memory complexity of the, the function. Um, here we lose a factor of delta, where delta is the maximum in degree of the graph. Uh, and we might ask, uh, right, is this reduction, uh, is this loss of the delta factor necessary? Um, it turns out it is. Um, so if you take the complete graph, uh, delta is n, uh, the cumulative memory complexity is just n, but the cumulative pebbling complexity is n squared. Um, so in this case, uh, loss, of, uh, loss of delta is actually necessary in the theorem. But I'll remark that in practice, delta is uh, you know, a small constant, um, and the unique parent property does hold in practice, right? So this, uh, this pebbling reduction covers all of the interesting examples that we would, uh, we would see in practice. Um, Okay, so we also find a way to improve the round function. Um, I will remark that we, uh, we implemented uh, our construction, um, and you can see here, um, whether we use the old edge structure or our new edge structure, whether we use the old round, func old round function or our new inherently sequential round function, uh, the performance is the same, right? Uh, so 
the optimal thing to do would be our, to use this DR sample plus bit reversal graph edge structure, use the inherently sequential round function. This is going to maximize the, uh, the attacker's cost. All right, uh, so I'm running out of time. I'll just uh, throw up a few uh, open questions. I think one of the biggest open questions uh, is really tightening some of these bounds, uh, these concrete bounds uh, um, on C, C of G, um, right? So we have asymptotically, we're, we're almost there, but uh, there's large gaps between uh, the lower bounds and uh, upper bounds in terms of constant factors. All right, uh, so I will uh, close there. Thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, we have time for one quick question, if someone has something. You had inputs to some of your functions where the uh, inputs were XORed, and so the question arises, does it make sense to compute partial XORs ahead of time? Uh, okay, yeah, so the question is, uh, when you're doing XORs, can you compute partial XORs ahead of time? And the answer is yes, you can, uh, you can compute partial XORs ahead of time. Um, and this is actually, um, this is actually the reason uh, why we lose this factor of delta in our reduction, right? Uh, so this is, this is exactly the challenge. Okay, thank you, Jeremiah.